lecture, but uh, hopefully I can amuse for 15 minutes. Um, well, good morning, everybody. As Jim said, my name is Simon Mills, and I'm the head of Sustainable Development at the City of London. And it gives me great pleasure to be here this morning at the opening of the World Green Roof Congress. Now, before I proceed any further, I really ought to explain a little bit about my employer. The City of London Corporation is the body which looks after the square mile of the City of London, which is the commercial and financial heart of the United Kingdom. It's also the scene from which Greater London grew. Now, the City of London Corporation's role is to enhance and maintain the city's place as the world's leading international financial centre for the benefit of London, Londoners and the nation. Um, and in pursuit of this noble aim, uh, we not only provide the standard local authority services, we, we clean the streets, we empty the bins, we, we grant planning permission, but we also fulfil a few unorthodox roles as well. For example, we're the Port Health Authority for the entire Table Thames. We manage about a third of London's open spaces, and we're the third largest fund of the arts in the country after the BBC and the Arts Council. And in fact, this evening, if any of you have any spare time, I would urge you to pop down the road to the Barbican Centre, which is Europe's largest mixed arts venue. Now, the reason I'm here today is because the city is very interested in green roads, but I really ought to say that this wasn't actually all was so. Um, on the 2nd of September, 1666, Thomas Farmer, baker to King George II of England, put the dogs turn off his own. Three hours later, his house in Pudding Lane burnt down. And in 1666, London was very much a city of thatch and wood, and it ignited a touch of a spark. Unfortunately, because there was a very strong wind that morning, sparks flew everywhere, and three days later, when the fire was finally out, destroyed about four-fifths of the city, including 13,000 houses and 90 parish churches. Now, needless to say, for the next 337 years, the city of London was a little bit suspicious of organic roofing materials. <laughs> but attitudes do change. And in 2003, the city signaled when it published its award-winning advice notes on green roofs. And today, you can find dozens of examples of green roofs around the city, and green roofs are very much a regular design feature of new developments. So, what I hope to do this morning is to try and take you on a very brief journey through the policy landscape that actually caused this change of heart, and perhaps indicate why green roofs are, certainly in the city, enjoying a burst of popularity. But I very much hope is here to stay. Now, you are all, of course, um, no strangers at all for the benefits of green roofs. Um, and the city is nothing if not pragmatic. However, for green roofs to actually be taken seriously, the concept had to overcome the innate conservatism of developers, of planners, and our elected members. As I've already stated, our um, primary role, the, the, what we consider to be our primary role, is to try and maintain the city as one of the world's leading international financial centres. And any unnecessary burdens on developers are very much frowned on. However, the city, like many other urban areas around the world, is now facing some specific challenges for which green roofs offer very cost-effective solutions. And there are two particular issues which have driven our interest in green groups, uh, and these are localised flooding and air quality. Now, let me try and explain why the first of these is very much a driver, and let me try and put flood risk in the city of London in context. The primary flood threat to the city doesn't come from the river Thames, but um, the Thames Barrier offers excellent levels of protection. And the city was built in, founded in Roman times, on a hill. Um, 
However, whilst the city of London does pride itself uh, very much on the high-tech infrastructure it contains today, we've got fiber optic ring lanes, we've got power computing and so on. Beneath the city streets is an entirely different story because we are served by a crumbling Victorian sewer network. Now, millions are actually being invested in London's wastewater treatment. But the fact remains that when you combine sewers and stormwater drainage, sometimes you're going to start to struggle to, to cope. And this leads to two specific problems. Stormwater discharge to the River Thames with its associated human health and pollution consequences, and also localised flooding. And with a lot of IT infrastructure and splendid facilities like this being in basements, um, this has very serious consequences indeed. And when you actually consider the, the frequency and magnitude of this risk is going to be amplified by the likely future impacts of climate change, it becomes obvious that long-term solutions are necessary. Now, climate change is an issue which the city takes very seriously indeed. The city of London Corporation is well over 800 years old, and we, we try to keep one eye on the future. Um, in fact, some of our open spaces have got 500 year management plans, which is usually an indication of how far ahead in some cases we do look. However, our concern is very much tinged with pragmatism. And in 2007, we produced the world's first urban climate adaptation strategy, and the focus was very much on risk management and business continuity. And it was through this that we actually picked up on the issue of surface water flooding and, and sewage flooding as issues which needed action. Now, earlier this year, when we revisited our climate change adaptation strategy and published our data version, we uh, found that our uh, original findings were confirmed and that green roofs are definitely a solution to this problem. And we can also demonstrate that we managed to successfully integrate green roofs within our local development. Climates. The bottom line is that we realise climate change is very much a long-term threat. So if we encourage the uptake of green roofs in new developments now, within 25 years we will have made a significant reduction to risk exposure in the city. Now I'm looking on to the second of the issues now, um, and in a similar vein, we would like to move on to the issue of air pollution. Air quality is actually a subject which is very dear to because in 1956, following years of killer smogs, we actually sponsored the private members bill which became the Clean Air Act. Now, unfortunately, it appears that a little over 50 years later we come full circle, and as you will no doubt aware, London is currently facing thousands of excess deaths a year due to air pollution, and also multi-million pound fines from the EU reaching air quality standards. Now, Air quality in London has been on the downward tra trajectory for, for some time. But the culprit isn't domestic coal fires anymore. It's, it's motor vehicles <coughs> and commercial boilers. And solutions, once again, are urgently needed. And once again, green roofs and green walls are a prone technology. They're a prone technology to help ameliorate air pollution. Now, coming uh, this coming November, we're actually going to be publishing our air quality strategy, detailing what steps we're going to be taking to bring this issue under control. Naturally, green roofs are going to feature heavily in this, and we are going to be making firm links to our planning policy to reinforce the guidance that we've got with respect to, to green roofs. So, what impact have these policy drivers actually had on the uptake of green roofs in the spare market? Now, um, it amused me as I was walking around looking at some of the displays on, on either side that I recognise an awful lot of the buildings which are there. And um, I don't know whether the City of London is, is a leader in the field of green roofs, but by God, we certainly produce some photogenic ones. Uh, so we, we get publicity, and green roofs are springing up all over the city. Um, and what's interesting is that they are they're put there for a range of uses. We have the the extensive green roofs, then you can see the one at, um, uh, I think that's 150 cheap side, 
uh, which is into St. Nexus and Falls. But we also got some interesting ones in Wood Street, where the staff restaurant is growing herbs on the roof, and where they've got beehives and so on. So it demonstrates some of the, some of the multiple uses you can put green roofs to. Um, and in fact, I'm currently being lobbied by some members of the staff at the City of London Corporation who are trying to convert an old roof ter terrace into a staff allotment club. And they want to get grow bags up there and grow fruit and vegetables and potter about at lunchtime. Um, the bottom line is that certainly in the city of London, green roofs are no longer considered wacky or alternative in, in any way. They are considered to be very practical solutions to some real uh, and pressing issues. And to this end, conditions on the green roofs are, are really becoming an increasingly common tool in our planning to get more and also responses to, to new developments. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I'd just like to say I think we've come a very long way since 1666. And for those of you who are wishing to follow us on our 400 year journey, there are some shortcuts. Um, and I think there's two key issues that you really need to consider. The first is that you need to be pragmatic. You need to understand that the green rules are right in the local context. And you need to identify what specific policy problems Green groups can, can help you overcome. And secondly, uh, as I've said, certainly within the city of London, um, <coughs> mainstream, but in some people's minds, green groups are still associated with alternative lifestyles. So a little education does go a very long way, and that's why today's event is so very, very important. Um, our head of planning likes to describe the City of London as a series of beehives on top of a compost heap. Um, we've got this frenetic financial activity in these beautiful offices taking place over this, this network of alleyways where you've got pubs and restaurants and, uh, and bars and so on. Um, but I hope that today's seminar is, is very much going to turn this view on its head so we're going to have compost heaps in the sky. Thank you very much. <laughs>